Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you can take your seats, we will begin. For those of you that don't know me, I am Tim Hartwig, and I teach at Bethany Lutheran Theological Seminary. On behalf of the Reformation Lectures Committee, Bethany Lutheran College and Bethany Lutheran Theological Seminary, I would like to invite you and welcome you to the, the lectures this year. I'm sure that the lectures will be theologically stimulated and pastorally beneficial. During your time here at Bethany, you are invited to get to know our beautiful campus. Please don't forget to visit the ELS Museum and the seminary. Becky DeGamo will be at the museum on Friday at 12.45. That's when she'll open it to answer questions and, and guide you through. Feel free to visit the seminary in any of the breaks. If you would like a guided tour, please speak to me and I'd be happy to arrange a guide for you. This is the 54th Reformation Lectures. If you look at the list of speakers of the past, you will see a diversity of lecturers from many of the branches of Lutheranism today. Dr. Sassi was the first in 1965, and I can't help but chuckle a little that you had to get a guy from down under, not a place known for its piety, to come and present to you that first time. You must have been desperate. The purpose of these lectures, lectures is to increase interest in and knowledge of the Reformation. The theme of this year's lecture series is Lutheran Care of Souls. These lectures all hinge on a very important pastoral term in Lutheranism. Seelsorge. This German word can be translated cure of souls, but this comes across somewhat coldly in English. Because of the warmth of the Germanic term, it is often brought straight into English texts. Seelsorge is the heart of pastoral ministry, applying the soothing balm of the gospel to souls battered by sin, death, and the devil. It is the pastoral care that Jesus demonstrated to the paralytic when he said, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Zelzorge is at the heart of the work of Christ's church on earth throughout time. The lectures this year look at Lutheran care of souls in three distinct time periods. Dr. Mattis will present on the Reformation period. Dr. Mays on the period of Lutheran orthodoxy, and Dr. Pless on the modern. After my introduction, we'll immediately begin the first lecture. The second lecture will be at 2 p.m. this afternoon. The third will be at 10.30 tomorrow morning. An open discussion of all three lectures will take place at 2 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. There will be time for discussion after each lecture, but Friday afternoon is especially dedicated to fielding questions from the audience. The format of the lectures is that of a free conference, and thus lectures are outside the framework of fellowship. With this in mind, we urge everyone to participate in the discussion. Finally, the three essays are being recorded and will be made available via the college and seminary websites. They will also be published in the March issue of the seminary's Lutheran Synod Quarterly. All of this information and more is available to you in the trifolds you receive with the opening lecture. The preliminaries are done. Now we can get to work. Dr. Mark Mattis serves as the Lutheran Bible Institute Chair in Theology, as well as Department Chair at Grandview University, Des Moines, Iowa. He has previously served parishes in Gardner, Illinois, and Antigua, Wisconsin. 
He earned the Bachelor of Arts degree from St. Olive College, the Master of Divinity degree from Luther Seminary, and the Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Chicago. He published several books, including Luther's Theology of Beauty, a reappraisal, The Role of Justification in Contemporary Theology, Imaging the Journey, and Law and Gospel in Action, Foundation Ethics Church. He has edited many, others, many other books and authored essays and reviews for journals. He currently serves as an associate editor for the Lutheran Quarterly. He and his wife, Carol, have three adult children and grandchildren living in Des Moines. Please welcome Dr. Mark Mattis. I'm truly honored and delighted to be with you here this morning. I'm very grateful for Professor Schmeling and his work uh, to bring me here along with the committee that has invited me to be here. I'm also very grateful that the papers are printed out. Sometimes it's hard to follow a speaker when the, the speaker is speaking. So it's much, much better uh, for comprehension that there is uh, a paper version available. So that said, I'm going to move right along. The Care of Souls, Cura Animarum, is part and parcel of an evangelical understanding of ministry. In the Confessio Augustana, Article 5, Melanchthon, a layman writes these familiar words. So that we may obtain this faith, the ministry of teaching the gospel and administering the sacraments was instituted. For through the word and the sacraments, as through instruments, the Holy Spirit is given, who affects faith where and when it pleases God and those who hear the gospel. Note two features in this definition of ministry that bear upon the care of souls. First, God works through the preaching office to regenerate sinners by giving them faith. Second, preaching is not only proclamatory, but also didactic. It teaches the gospel, providing not only comfort for those who are repentant, anxious, melancholic, or grieving, but also guidance. That is, while upholding the proper distinction between law and gospel, the most important biblical insight into pastoral care, we must also honor the gospel in the broad sense if we are to be true to the pastoral office. The Saxon visitations of the late 1520s were a crucial aspect of reforming the church, and these visitations focused on both teaching true doctrine and upholding evangelical practices. As Melanchthon chided the Dominicans for inventing meritorious spiritual practices unfounded in scripture, such as the rosary, he condemned them for not preaching the gospel in the broad sense. About the righteousness of faith, about true repentance, about works that have the command of God. Instead, they spend their time on either philosophical discussions or ceremonial traditions that obscure Christ. That said, the early Lutheran movement sought to excise pastoral care over against the false teaching that sinners can acquire merit by rendering satisfaction to God for their sins as a part of the sacrament of penance, or that our sufferings are able to help us achieve merit, reduce the length of punishment to be endured in purgatory, and not only conform us to the image of Christ. Luther and Melanchthon predate the modern arrangement of theology into biblical, historical, dogmatic, and pastoral subdivisions. Hence, for the reformers, the study of theology throughout is as much pastoral as biblical, historical, or systematic. All theology is guided by pastoral care. And all pastoral care is guided by theology. 
and not in our own modern context, secular psychology. All theology hinges upon its ability to lead sinners to repentance, enable them to honor God, provide consolation to the repentant or the despairing, consolation to those grieving, encouragement to those plagued by anfechtungen, spiritual attacks, assaults from the father of lies, and uphold spiritual disciplines such as prayer and meditation, arising from and centered on scripture. As a friar, Luther experienced Anfechtungen since he anticipated judgment upon his death because either he failed to qualify for salvation or he was not numbered among the elect. Pastoral care seeks to sustain, heal, reconcile, and guide Christians. It is manifest in preaching the Lord's Supper, confession and absolution, catechization of youth and adults, but also the mutual conversation and consolation of the brethren. Luther excelled at such conversation, think of his table discussions with his guests, and consolation as we shall see in his letters of spiritual counsel. To be sure, pastoral care is not the tail wagging the theological dog. That is, the reformation of the church was not based on finding a gracious God precisely so that Christians could become laxer than their medieval Roman counterparts expected. For Luther, the reformatory impulse is guided solely by truth, with scripture as the ultimate standard in all matters. The happy result of Luther's reform is that life-giving pastoral care is restored. God's law quiets every mouth claiming merit and leads sinners to despair of themselves as sinners, while God's gospel proclaims good news, a promise liberating sinners from both accusation and the power of sin. That said, Luther's theology was devoted to sound pastoral care and authentic Christian devotion. It could appeal to the work of previous and contemporary curates like Jean Gerson, Johannes Paltz, or his mentor and head of his order, Johannes von Staupitz, and focusing on spiritual edification and consolation, not on speculation, or as Luther rather dramatically put it, for a man becomes a theologian by living or rather by experiencing death and condemnation, not by mere understanding reading, or speculation. The topic of pastoral care in the Reformation can be explored in at least two ways. A historical presentation of how the Reformers' views of pastoral care differ from medieval or ancient views, or instead a topical approach. This address will take the latter tactic, even though it will begin with Luther's reform of penance, one of the first matters he dealt with in his opposition to Rome. Unlike Martin Chemnitz's Ministry, Word, and Sacraments in Enchiridion, or the Reformed theologian Martin Butzer's Concerning the True Care of Souls, Luther did not write a manual on, on pastoral care. That said, he is a master diagnostician of souls, not only because of his grasp of scriptural truth, but also because he knew firsthand spiritual trial, terror, and grief. Luther was unguarded with respect to his life with God. This is a trait from which we all can learn. Luther expressed the potency of such spiritual trial in the Operationes in Salmos. The cross tests all things. The cross alone is our theology. God uses trials to purge us of sin and so liberates our hearts, allows us to love God above all things, humans' chief obligation, which likewise accords with their nature as creatures. Hammond Sasa appropriately cautions, the theology of the cross does not mean that for a theologian, the church here shrinks together into nothing but Good Friday. Rather, it means that Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost cannot be understood without Good Friday. In comparison with many presentations of the Christian faith, one of Luther's greatest strength for sound pastoral care is that pain, whether that of the pangs of conscience or despair of the self, disease, the plague, 
insecurity about one's status before God or others, grief or sadness is not sugarcoated, bypassed, or tranquilized. Luther offers neither a Bible camp nor a non-denominational happy, clappy Jesus bereft of his five wounds. Not to mention his agonizing experience of God's rejection of sinners, a sentence of death and hell which he vicariously bore not for his sake, he was sinless, but for our sakes. Instead, Luther presents the Jesus of the Gospels, whoever faced opposition from legalists and libertines alike, along with explicit attacks from the accuser himself. Few theologians have drawn out the implications not only of Christ's full divinity, but also his full humanity, as does Luther. I speculate, and I, I'm away from the text here in saying this, that much of this was due to his deep immersion of his studies in the book of Hebrews in 1517. The reformer's work echoes the author of Hebrews, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. This compassion, vindicated by the Father in Jesus' resurrection, Jesus is the death of death, the hell of hell, is activated in the new life of faith evoked by the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts. This truth, wholly configured through the missions of the Holy Trinity, is foundation of pastoral care. As Luther put it, I didn't learn my theology all at once. I had to ponder over it ever more deeply, and my spiritual trials were of help to me in this. For one does not learn anything without practice. What kind of physician would that be who stayed in school all the time? Why shouldn't this be so in the case? of the Holy Scriptures too. No doubt the world in which Luther crafted his theology of pastoral care was significantly different from our own. Luther took for granted that the world is not devoid of spiritual reality, but is instead filled with angels and demons, not to mention that God himself is ever present though masked in all things. Luther's world was not divested of spiritual reality as we face today due to the assumptions of Systemic secularism. Does that phrase make sense? Systemic secularism. Which tends, which tends in subtle and not so subtle ways to erase the vertical dimension, our relationship with God in public life. But it was also socially arranged in terms of hierarchies, level, stages, ranks, and gradation assuming a continual interplay between the higher and lower levels of a hierarchy. To be sure, our own economic, educational, political, and social arrangements are by no means wholly egalitarian, since they are filled with various alphas and power structures. It was also a world in which death was ubiquitous. As Ronald Rickers notes, one out of every four or five infants died in their first year of life and only half reached the age of 10. Those who survived childhood could be stricken with any number of diseases and were also susceptible to the three great threats of war, famine, and plague, which recurred on a regular basis. One German city experienced an outbreak of plague every 11 years on average, which was characteristic for most urban centers in the German lands. And such statistics bore on people's psychological health. The anxiety that this feeling of vulnerability created contributed to the inward suffering of the age, which also included grief and depression, along with doubt and despair, each of which is abundantly attested to in the extent sources. In a word, suffering was pervasive. Perhaps Europeans and North Americans do not suffer to the degree that folks did in Luther's day, but we too suffer, whether psychologically or physically, that Luther does not avoid pain, but highlights it as a crucial component or contribution to spiritual growth is most helpful. After all, many young people today define themselves through their hurt. Luther's approach to pastoral care shares an Ankenutfungspunkt with them. 
Luther's world acknowledged that we are accountable to God. Contemporary leaders often absent God from public life. We are beset with systemic secularism in which public institutions go far beyond the separation of church and state and favor a freedom from religion stance. Separation of church and state was intended by the founders to allow for the protection of religious minorities without the interference, harassment, or persecution of a state church. In no way did freedom of religion translate into freedom from religion, as many elites would tout today. That said, for many contemporaries, the goal is not to live a godly life, but instead to affirm a chosen lifestyle or perceived identity. For moralistic therapeutic deists, God does not interfere with the self and its project of creating itself. This word, autopoiesis, Hence, we seek not a gracious God, but a gracious neighbor. In spite of the differences between our world and that of Luther, there is significant overlap. People suffer today, even if their options for accessible health care, social networks, governmental infrastructures, and the like provide greater security. One example, over the last several years, certainly during the pandemic, suicide rates are up. Perhaps our current tendency to tranquilize ourselves with the trivial, seek to fill the emptiness of our being with pleasure, greed, sex, or the woke mentality which cleanly and without exceptions reductionistically divvies up people into either haves or have nots, victims or perpetrators, which encourages people to define themselves on the basis of grievance until the powers that be are dislodged. Our drugging ourselves with entertainment is not so very different from Michael Montaigne. Philosophy of life that directs us to enjoy the moment and take leave of unsolvable metaphysical and religious conundrums which contribute to social violence and personal disquiet. We revel in superficiality. The message we send youth flatlines meaning, reduces reality to the merely horizontal supposes that in the buffet line of ideologies, youth will find something right for them to serve as their vertical dimension, purpose, or meaning in life. Likewise, the woke movement is not so very different from the peasant protests of Luther's day. Overlap between ourselves and Luther and Melanchthon is considerable when seen in this light. One important difference between Luther's day and our own, however, is the pervasiveness and publicness of various religious practices designed to help one accrue merit and make satisfaction for one's sin. Pilgrimages, indulgences, fasting, certain prayers, monastic life, clerical celibacy, the evangelical councils of poverty, chastity, and obedience, the mass as a non-bloody sacrifice in which we, along with the priest, re-offer Christ again on behalf of the sins of those present, as well as designated souls in purgatory. All speak to an entrenched legalistic approach to the gospel which kept people on the hook with respect to their ultimate salvation. No one could be assured of salvation. Unless reconciliation with the church was sought through the sacrament of penance, slip-ups in, um, in mortal sin jeopardized the hope of salvation. Luther's protest against the sale of indulgences, a practice which he saw as incompatible with the sacrament of penance, precisely because it was designed to let sinners off the hook and not truly repent, allowed him to challenge the notion that satisfaction should follow absolution. The early Luther responded, a Christian who is truly contrite seeks and loves to pay penalties for his sins. The bounty of indulgences, however, relaxes penalties and causes men to hate them. At least it furnishes occasion for hating them. The system was designed to keep one from having certainty with respect to their salvation, one salvation. It was incompatible with the gospel as Luther had received it from his father confessor, Johann von Staupitz, and others in the Erfurt Friary. In a sense, the Reformation itself was triggered by a pastoral care concern. Whether or not a sinner could be assured of forgiveness by means of the sacrament of penance. The Fourth Lateran Council in Canon 21 directed, All the faithful of either sex, after they have reached the age of discernment, should individually confess all their sins in a faithful manner 
to their own priest at least once a year and let them take care to do what they can to perform the penance imposed on them. Let them reverently receive the sacrament of the Eucharist at least at Easter, unless they think for a good reason and on the advice of their own priest, that they should abstain from receiving it for a time. Otherwise, they shall be barred from entering a church during their lifetime, and they shall be denied a Christian burial at death. Additionally, the confessor was required to hold matters confessed with strictest confidentiality. The priest shall be discerning and prudent, so that like a skilled doctor, he may pour wine and oil over the wounds of the injured one. Let him carefully inquire about the circumstances of both the sinner and the saint, so that he may prudently discern what sort of advice he ought to give and what remedy to apply. Using various means to heal the sick person, let him take the utmost care, however, not to betray the sinner at all by word or sign or in any other way, for if anyone presumes to reveal a sin disclosed to him in confession, we decree that he is not only to be deposed from his priestly office, but also to be confined to a strict monastery to do perpetual penance. For Luther, the problem with uh, penance was its ambiguity. It can mean either the remorse of the sinner or the penance imposed on the sinner by the church. The penitential system of the medieval church fused both meanings into the term do penance, which meant both a contrite heart and the fulfillment of satisfactions. This understanding partially caused Luther's desperation in the monastery. On the one hand, he realized that he could never completely atone for his sins, despite his constant struggle to do penance properly. On the other hand, he believed that without penance, no one could stand before God guilt-free. As mentioned, the penitential system, far from securing Luther or others in their journey with God, did precisely the opposite. It was expected that penitents recount all their mortal sins to the priest. The sacrament was either valid or invalid, depending on an extensive set of conditions in addition to sufficient sorrow for sin. Additionally, works of uh, penance or satisfaction of practice, which Luther roundly criticized in the 95 Theses as contrary to the practice of the ancient church, contributed to uncertainty. The sacrament of penance, as practiced by Rome, was unable to deliver the goods of forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Ultimately, Luther would redefine the principal parts of the sacrament as absolution, faith, and peace instead of confession, absolution, and satisfaction. What was so problematic about the sacrament of penance for Luther? Surely a once annual private confession is no burden. But for the effort to count as contrition, a penitent must demonstrate sufficient sorrow. By what criterion should that be measured? Additionally, all mortal sins must be recounted, but again, can we be sure that we will remember and enumerate all of them? Then after the granting of absolution, some prescribed works of penance or satisfaction are prescribed. The rubric for ascertaining the validity of the forgiveness is unclear. As early as the 95 Theses, Luther protested the requirement of doing works of penance after the granting of absolution. It was an exercise that did not accord with the practice of the ancient church. At the core of Luther's complaint was the inability of the sacrament to grant certainty with respect to forgiveness. But perhaps that was the goal of the medieval penitential system. Luther complained that this sacrament fed priestly control over the faithful. The priests create nothing but tyranny out of this lovely and comforting authority of the keys, as if Christ were thinking only of the will and dominion of the priests when he instituted the keys. Luther wrote, therefore, the longer I tried to heal my uncertain, weak, and troubled conscience with human traditions, the more uncertain, weak, and troubled I continually made it. The medieval approach to confession made it impossible for absolution to deliver the goods of forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. As Luther revised the practice of confession, he humanized the whole process. First, 
he acknowledged that it is impossible to enumerate all sins. Likewise, it is not possible for sinners to make reparation to God for mortal sins. A penitent's prayer will be, O Lord God, I do not have what I should have, and I cannot do it. Grant what you command and command what you will. The Roman configuration of the sacrament of penance promoted works righteousness and anxious consciences because of its requirement that penitents confess every mortal sin in order to be forgiven and the requirement that penitents perform works of satisfaction in order for the priestly absolution to be efficacious. Luther's evangelical soteriology held that human beings' fallen condition made it impossible to discern all their sins and that Christ's atonement precluded the need for human works of satisfaction. Forgiveness was a gift of sheer grace that was received by faith. Luther did not seek to have private confession disappear from the church. The large catechism includes a brief exhortation to confession. Luther unmasked various Roman Catholic practices which sought to acquire merit, such as indulgences, pilgrimages, and asceticism as tantamount to trusting in oneself, which issues finally in despair and eternal damnation. Faith in Jesus Christ, objective atonement alone is the way to relieve the conscience. That said, it is appropriated in faith. It is no opera ex operato. Instead, the goods are received in trusting that God does what he says he'll do. Forgive sins. For as you believe, so it is done for you. Much is made of the so-called happy exchange in Luther, as well it should, with both its biblical and medieval heritage, especially in the spiritual writings of Bernard de Clairvaux embedded in it, it is a powerful tool to reorient penitent sinners and confirm their status as beloved children of God, allowing faith active in love to awaken in them. But it is not the only exchange of which Luther speaks. Quoting Freedom of a Christian, the late Eberhard Jungel, and here I appeal to Jungel not as a systematician but as historical theologian, for Luther, in faith, there first occurs the most solemn of all exchanges in which God is declared and in which God declares one to be truthful. When, however, God sees that we consider him truthful and by the faith of our heart pay him the great honor which is due him, he does us that great honor of considering us truthful and righteous for the sake of our faith. That we consider God truthful and righteous this is righteous and truthful, and it makes us righteous and truthful because it is true and right that God be considered truthful, which those who do not believe do not. Without truth toward God, one is not truthful and thus also not free. Only the truth can make one free. But in the medium of truth, the human being is both object and subject. When spoken to by an alien authority addressing it, and by this, authority speaks to itself. Jung hammers home how faith gives God the honor that is his due, but all in light of the gospel promise. For this reason, the one who by faith gives truth its due must not perish. Faith cannot give the accusing law its due without giving the liberating gospel its due even more. Through his own humanity, God has overridden humanity's lost existence and thus overridden his accusing word through his liberating word, a word which faith must trust all the more. But so that you come out of and away from yourself, that is, out of your corruption, he sets you before his dear son, Jesus Christ, and lets his living, comforting word say to you, you shall surrender to him with firm faith and trust in him anew. The pastoral task wants to shape a community in which people fear, love, and trust in God above all things, the heart of this solemn exchange. The most important discovery that the early Luther made as he interpreted and taught scripture, studied Bernard of Clairvaux, Augustine, the German theology, Johannes Tauler, and absorbed the wisdom of his Seelsorge Staupitz, was the proper distinction between law and gospel. 
Here we speak of gospel not in the broad sense, but the narrow. This is one of the most effective tools that pastors have in their toolkit. Mainline Protestant pastors and many evangelical pastors are confused about their role. What is a pastor's calling all about? Both groups default to the modern role of pastor as therapist, social worker, or CEO. Eventually, these false guises eat away at those called to this vocation, leading to cynicism and burnout. If you know what you are about or what you are supposed to do, then you are able to establish appropriate boundaries so that you do not yourself become diffuse. You are empowered to stay true to your mission, especially as you see your gifts reinforced and encouraged over time. You are able to set realistic goals for yourself because ultimately God is responsible for your ministry and not you. Appealing to the three traditional university-trained vocations, law, medicine, and ministry. Luther noted that lawyers deal uh, with people in terms of property, physicians in terms of health, but pastors in terms of sin. Preaching the law accuses smug, unrepentant people of their sin while preaching the gospel, comforts terrified sinners with the good news that in Jesus Christ, God is for them. As Luther put it in his lectures on Psalm 51, the proper subject of theology is man guilty of sin and condemned and God, the justifier and savior of man, the sinner. Whatever is asked or discussed in theology outside this subject is air and poison. All scripture points to this, that God commends his kindness to us and in his son restores to righteousness and life the nature that has fallen into sin and condemnation. In his commentary on Galatians, his greater commentary, 1535, Luther clarified that such a proper distinction between the function of the law and that of the gospel keeps all genuine theology in its correct use. It also establishes us believers in a position as judges over all styles of life and over all the laws and dogmas of men. Finally, it provides us with a faculty for testing all the spirits by contrast, because the papists have completely intermingled and confused the doctrine of the law and that of the gospel, they have been unable to teach anything certain either about faith or about works or about styles of life or about judging the spirits. And the same thing is happening to the sectarians today. This proper distinction can be learned only from intense study of the scriptures as well as responding to the Anfechtungen, which one encounters in one's own experience. As Luther put it, it is not self-taught, but instead pastors are under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit. The experience is directed not by the medieval scheme, scheme of lexio, oratio, and contemplatio, where contemplation is similar to Plato or Aristotle put on the highest level, beyond trial and tribulation when reading scripture, but it is instead directed at oratio, meditatio, and tentatio, that is the life of prayer, the daily praying through the Psalter that Luther did in the monastery along with the regular cycle of worship is formative and transformative of the Christian. It leads us into the scriptures and through meditating on them, we encounter the accuser's charges alongside God's own directives. All this humbles a Christian and guides the Christian to seek solace, comfort, and power in the gospel alone. John Pless summarizes the pastoral implications of this truth nicely. It is instead a functional distinction that is critical for pastoral diagnosis of a person's spiritual condition before God. Without this distinction, one cannot test the spirit, that is, discern the truth of Christ from human fabrications or demonic counterfeits. Enables the pastor to use this theology evangelically so that the guilty are broken by the law and those so crushed are vivified by the word of forgiveness. Luther's view of pastoral care has no Rogerian overtones. By that, I'm referring to Carl Rogers. It is not about offering unconditional positive regard. Like the prophets of yore, it calls out the sins of idolatry and injustice, not to be confused with the Marxist-inspired social justice warriors, as well as sound stewardship of the earth given that Adam and Eve's original calling was to be 
tenders of God's garden. The law is best preached not with a closed fist, but instead simply as telling the truth. Quoted earlier, Jungel, raised in the former East Germany, was attracted to the church precisely because it was the one place where one was most apt to hear and speak truth, all other places being strictly under the surveillance of the Stasi, though even the church was not immune from Stasi interference. Luther would direct clergy today to simply state the truth, even in the face of our systemically secular culture. But if you do expect secular fragility, anticipate secular-minded people's defenses to go way up. Luther's deep pastoral sensitivity brings out not only neglected scriptural truths such as the theology of the cross, the fundamentally receptive nature of humans before God, a theology of the sacraments which allows them to deliver God's promise in a graspable way, and the proper distinction of law and gospel, but also the hidden God. Obviously, God is hidden from the eye in the torture that our Lord Jesus experienced on the cross, not only the physical agony, but even more so emotional agony of bearing all human sin, a position not widely appreciated by medieval theologians, even if Christ in popular piety and art was portrayed as the man of sorrows. Luther also pointed out another divine hiddenness, that God is masked in all creation, that if we attempt either through metaphysics or mysticism to climb into the divine reality, we will only experience anguish. Sheer abstractions about God's goodness alone, apart from the shed blood of Christ, will not bring sinners to God, no matter how philosophical or spiritual those sinners may be. No doubt expressing his disappointment with the mysticism of the pseudo-Dionysius or the subtleties of metaphysical reasonings about God found in Scotus or Occam. Luther noted, the people of Israel did not have a God who was viewed absolutely, to use the expression, the way the inexperienced monks rise into heaven with their speculations and think about God as he is in himself. From this absolute God, everyone should flee who does not want to perish because human nature and the absolute God, for the sake of teaching, we use this familiar term, are the bitterest of enemies. Human weakness cannot help being crushed by such majesty. As scripture reminds us over and over, let no one therefore interpret David as speaking with the absolute God. He is speaking with God as he is dressed and clothed in his word and promises so that the name God, we cannot exclude Christ who God promised to Adam and the other patriarchs. We must take hold of this God, not naked, but clothed and revealed in his word. Otherwise, certain despair will crush us. This distinction must always be made between the prophets who speak with God and the Gentiles. The Gentiles speak with God outside his word and promises according to the thoughts of their own hearts. But the prophets speak with God as he is clothed and revealed in his promises and word. This God clothed in a, such a kind appearance and so to speak in such a pleasant mask, that is to say dressed in his promises, this God we can grasp and look at with joy and trust. The absolute God, on the other hand, is like an iron wall against which we cannot bump without destroying ourselves. To see how Luther draws out the pastoral implications of his view of the hidden God, particularly with respect to the question of one's own election to eternal life, consider his table talk recorded by Kasper Heiderreich. Speaking of God's voice, the reformer writes, Here I wish to remain unrevealed. I shall reveal your election in another way. From the unrevealed God, I shall become the revealed God. I shall incarnate my son and shall give you one who will enable you to see whether you are elected. Do this. Give up your speculations, which are apart from the word of God. Thoroughly root them out and drive them to the devil in hell. This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Behold his death, cross, and passion. See him hanging on his mother's breast and on the cross. As Stavanger theologian Knut Ausvog puts it, Christ must be Christologically bridged, and I would reword that, that is that God himself does the Christological bridging in order for him to be experienced as the sheer overflowing goodness 
that he is in and of himself. This Christological bridge is mediated through the preaching Christ crucified. Nor should the proper distinction of law and gospel be misread as obviating the rule of the law in the Christian life. It is not as if law and gospel preaching should be devoid of directives. Luther's preaching is marked throughout with directives of one sort or another. As he formalized it in the bondage of the will, promise comes first, but exhortations then follow. So, for example, in the Invocavit sermons, where Luther encourages the Wittenbergers to disown the more radical paths of reform proposed by Karlstadt, an offense to those weak, of weak faith. Instead, Luther says that believers must not insist upon their own rights, but must see what may be useful and helpful to their brothers and sisters. As Paul says, omnia mihi lit, lit chink sed non omnia expedient. A simple reading of Luther's postals will reveal that they are often didactic and extension of catechesis, seeking to interpret the treasures of the scriptures and the Christian tradition, not only to secure people in Christ, but also to empower them to live out their Christian walk in lives of discipleship within their vocations. Luther's sermon do not follow the pattern of Richard Kemmerer's approach of goal, malady, means. It is not as if you could do a word count of distinctively law words with their accompanying accusation, which should be 50% of the sermon, and a word count of distinctively gospel words with their accompanying promise, the remainder percentage, in any of Luther's sermons. Instead, Luther allows the scripture to speak for itself and allows the Holy Spirit either to accuse or comfort as the Spirit sees fit. Stephen Peach notes that consolation is the art of comforting and consoling those in affliction, that we have correspondence from Luther in the genre of consolation clues us into the very strategies which Luther used to help ease others' pain, whether anxiety, melancholia, grief, scrupulosity, suicide, and other such situations. Peach notes that as written communication, consolation included seven basic elements which could be expanded or contracted and re reordered or reiterated. Salutatio, exordium, narratio, argumentatio, remedia, e exhortatio, and conclusio. An in-depth examination of such a letter, specifically that to Jerome Veller, can give us a clue into Luther's uncanny pastoral aptitude. Veller, a student preparing for ministry, longtime friend of Luther and tutor to Luther's children, was struggling with depression in the summer of 1530 while residing in Luther's home. It is likely that Veller suffered from scrupulosity, as Luther did as a young monk. We are not given the specific details, but something ate at his sense of adequacy, which he was not able to squelch on his own. He became a victim of his own accusations, it would seem. After a brief salutation and opening words, Luther jumps right into the matter plaguing Vela. Vela's Anfechtungen indicate not something for which he is responsible, another matter for which he should blame himself, but instead they are onslaughts of the devil. But surprisingly as such, they are not all bad. Indeed, they are a sure sign that you have a gracious and merciful God. Obviously a smug and sensitive person whose heart is indifferent to God's law, as opposed to someone who actually should suffer Anfechtungen, would never be in Veller's position. But Veller's sensitivity and desire to be true to Christ precisely makes him vulnerable to Satan's attack. Luther noted that people such as Eck and Zwingli, enemies of the gospel, are at ease and happy, while all of us who are Christians must have the devil for our adversary. Veller's afflictions are not evidence that he has been condemned by God, just the opposite. Bad, unevangelical un theologians prosper while faithful ones suffer are attacked by the accuser. And the accuser is tenacious. If he does not succeed in getting his victim to despair on the first bounce, he'll keep up the attack. So Luther outlines a strategy for dealing with the accuser. Similar to standard guidance for dealing with a bully, Luther advises, don't 
argue with the devil. Don't feed his power by taking him seriously. Instead, you must hold the devil in contempt. Laugh at him and do not allow him to isolate you from others. Instead, seek others out. That way the devil cannot corner you. Here, Luther was dependent upon advice from Jean Gerson, the Dr. Consolatorius. Jason followed the ancient Stoic strategy of consolation, coping with suffering, affliction, or loss. Depends on how effectively one can place it within a larger rational framework, and in so doing, objectify it and distance oneself from it emotionally. Indeed, Jason's influence on Luther is precisely in identifying mel melancholic moods as the devil's attack. Likewise, it was Jason who was apt to urge that depressive make fun of and show contempt for the devil rather than being afraid of him. The importance of embracing life's eternal gifts of joy, food, laughter, wine, music, the use of cognitive and diversional strategies to counter depressive moods, such as Luther's advising Vela to join in the company of others rather than to isolate himself. No doubt this later strategy would sound counterintuitive to many who suffer depression. They often do not feel up to socializing, that their depression makes them less than convivial. Luther's admonition is just the opposite of a melancholic strategy or tendency to self-isolate. Luther tells Jerome that he must engage in merry talking games with my wife and the rest, so as to defeat these devilish thoughts. And you must be intent on being cheerful. Luther urges life-affirming behaviors that disempower or relativize the accusations and concomitant depression. Luther then goes on to relate the comfort that Staupitz had given him when he suffered depression as a young monk. Luther was transparent about his own scrupulous self-condemning thoughts to Staupitz. Staupitz's reply, which Luther appropriates for Vela, is that the affliction is useful and necessary. God has a purpose behind it. Uh, that through such affliction, Luther was being groomed to accomplish great things, even though while suffering, he never would have believed this to be possible. In addition to Staupitz, an anonymous man whom Luther had, had comforted, uh, uh, whom who had comforted Luther told him the same thing in Erfurt. Hence, Luther re-situates the trial from being a pointless experience to one that potentially can help one grow and be empowered for ministry. Luther then writes, whenever the devil worries you with these thoughts, seek the company of men at once or drink somewhat more liberally, jest and play some jolly prank or do anything ex exhilarating. Occasionally, a person must drink somewhat more liberally engage in plays and jests, or even commit some little sin from hatred and contempt of the devil, so as to leave him no room for raising scruples in our conscience about the most trifling matters. For when we are over-anxious and careful, we fear that we may be doing wrong. In any matter, we shall be conquered. Luther not only commends diversionary tactics, but also a uh, sleight of hand with the devil. Clearly, the devil is using small sins to keep Vela inward looking, seeking to be blameless on the basis of his own proper righteousness and not the alien righteousness of Christ. Luther forbids Vela to take Satan's bait or fall for Satan's trick of counting on proper righteousness to justify himself before God, and no doubt other humans humans as well. If the devil is holding forth scruples as his way to harass and oppress, then the pastoral response is to wholly disempower the devil. Chad Vegas notes that Luther's purpose was not to provide Jerome permission to sin. He was not encouraging Jerome to continue in sin so that grace may abound. To the contrary, he was helping Jerome to avoid biting down on the hook Satan had baited with the greater sin of self-righteousness. Indeed, Luther was worried that Vela avoid an improper use of the law. Luther was concerned that Jerome's heart and mind were being easily confused by the fallen human tendency to turn back in upon our own self-righteousness. 
Luther's admonition proves that the devil and his accusations are no match for Christ and his righteousness. It is Christ who Veller must trust and not his own abilities. If Luther's righteousness covers our sin, then even our lapses, which are inevitable, cannot make us vulnerable, such that we are beyond God's mercy and love. Luther offers the most potent remedia possible for anyone suffering scrupulosity, Christ's alien righteousness. Hence, Luther's exhortation is, drink up. Outwit the devil by not playing his game. If you play the devil's game on your own terms, you'll never win. But if you play the game on Christ's terms, you have won already because Christ has already won. When the devil uses the law to accuse, don't argue with it, agree to it. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What then will happen to me? Why? You will be eternally damned. Yet accusation is never the last word. The last word for any scrupulous soul who runs to Jesus is, I know one who has suffered and made satisfaction for me. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Where he abides, there will I also abide. The gospel wholly reframes the identity of a sinner, such that the law as accusing has no bearing whatsoever upon the conscience. A major difference between Luther and his medieval forebears was that suffering offered nothing salvific. For the medieval thinkers, not only penance would help free one from purgatory, but even suffering could be rendered meritorious. Ronald Ritger's note, suffering was not simply punishment for sin. It was also an expression of divine grace because it provided one with an opportunity to shorten one's stay in purgatory and also be conformed more closely to the image of Christ and the saints. In many ways, the patient endurance of divinely sent suffering was the ideal penance, for it rendered compensation to Christ the judge in kind for his suffering on humanity's behalf. For Luther's suffering cannot be counted as a penance along with good works, but it does humble us, disempowers the old Adam, and leads us to trust in God's mercy alone. Rickers notes that suffering mortifies the old man by persuading Christians once again of their wretchedness and nothingness before God, along with his subsequent ongoing need to receive all things, especially righteousness from God. Indeed, hardship causes enlargement or dilution of the Christian soul or dilation of the Christian soul and brings growth in the new person in Christ. Luther noted in his sermons on 1 Peter, it is characteristic of a Christian life to improve constantly and to become pure. When we come to faith through the preaching of the gospel, we become pious and begin to be pure. But as long as we're still in the flesh, we never become completely pure. For this reason, God throws us right into the fire, that is, into suffering, disgrace, and misfortune in this way, we are purged more and more until we die. No works can do this for us, for how can an external work cleanse the heart inwardly? But when faith is tested in this way, all alloy and everything false must disappear. Uh, when Christ is revealed, splendid honor, praise, and glory will follow. It is beyond the confines of this paper to present all of Luther's insights into pastoral care but it is valuable to mention the comfort that he brought his own mother when she was ill and not long after would die. In 1531, he noted to her that, that this sickness of yours is his gracious fatherly chastisement. It is quite a slight thing in comparison with what he inflicts on the godless and sometimes even upon his own dear children. Gently presenting her the gospel, he wrote, should any thought of sin or death frighten us, let us Live up our hearts and say, Behold, dear soul, what are you doing? Dear death, dear sin, how is it that you are alive and terrify me? Do you not know that you have been overcome? Do you, death, not know that you are quite dead? Do you not know the one who has said of you, I have overcome the world? It does not behoove me to listen to or heed your terrifying suggestions. 
I shall pay attention only to the cheering words of my Savior. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He is the conqueror, the true hero, who in these words, be of good cheer, gives me the benefit of his victory. I shall cling to him. To his words and comfort, I shall hold fast. Whether I remain here or go yonder, he will not forsake me. Conclusion. For the Lutheran reformers, the Holy Spirit uses the pastoral office for preaching the gospel and administering the means of grace, but the Holy Spirit also creates a pastor's heart, the ability to empathize with others in their pain and fearlessly comfort them, not based on their ability to empathize, but instead on God's objective word of truth. A pastor's heart is forged in the trials one experiences in life, precisely as the candidate for ministry or pastor prays and meditates on scripture. Not only pastors, but all Christians are being purged of their old Adam with its self-centered agency and find themselves more compassionate. Not only no one chooses afflictions, but even though they contribute no merit, they are not beyond, but instead precisely within God's orbit of creativity. As we sing with David, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That is ever on a Christian's lips. The gospel not only comforts those attacked by the accusations of law, but also those undergoing grief, trial, and all afflictions. The pastor not only comforts, but also guides people, grounding them in scriptural wisdom. It is a privilege to offer pastoral care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mattis. Uh, we have about 20, 25 minutes for questioning. There are microphones at, on either side. So if you have a question, please uh, go to a microphone. When it's your turn to speak, please announce who you are and where you're from. So if you have any questions, you can go to the mics now. I was warned I may have to prime the pump, so I came prepared. Uh, Dr. Mattis, thank you, thank you for your, your presentation and paper. Uh, there, there was one particular thing that I wondered if you would be able to uh, elaborate on. It's on page five, and I thought it was an insightful statement, and I'm hoping you could make it a little more concrete and it's on the top of the page, and you simply say this, after all, many young people today define themselves through their hurt. Are there concrete examples that you could give, and then how would the, the cure of souls or the care for souls be provided to those specific individuals? Yeah, uh, yeah um, oh, okay. Um, yes, if you notice, there are several times in the paper that, that I made references to young people because that's, that's who I work with on a, a daily basis. And it isn't even just um, uh, the most recent years, I would almost say the last 20 or, or so. Um, it, it's, I, to make it more concrete, uh, people define themselves through their hurt. Yeah, that is a very abstract way of, of, of speaking, very abstract. But it's very common when I, when, um, when I get to know students, um, very often so, uh, there's a, 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 a story of pain, of deep hurt, um, uh, neglect, uh, di divorce, abuse. I, I once asked a class, um, uh, where is this Netflix show that I don't recommend 13 Reasons Why, but it, it, I, it led to a discussion um, and I asked how many of you have been bullied and I, I was quite taken aback that half the class raised their hand. I, I would never have anticipated such a thing. I, um, and um, that really shouted at me. So um, 
Um, I think for, I'm, I'm not making any statement about tattoos, but I think for many young people, tattoos are a way of engraving in their own body. It's a very, it's a, a, a something of a painful experience. I'm led to believe I don't have any tattoos uh, <laughs> to, to receive them, but it's a way of engraving your own body with a memory. And, and, and in such, again, I'm not taking a stance on tattoos other, other than to say, if, if there is a pain associated with that too, that's a way of incorporating that pain into one's own narrative so it doesn't overwhelm you. Okay, it's a part of my body. It isn't all of me. So I could almost put such a thing in a positive construction in that way. But um, yeah, I, I, th I think the first thing that, that strikes me or, or um, comes to my mind is simply so many of the stories I, I hear. Um, I think part of it is, represents our culture. Our culture is much more therapeutic. Now, I was born in the late 1950s. Um, uh, the world I was born into was, was not therapeutic. <laughs> um, it, it simply was not. But the, uh, the, the world, um, uh, as I say, I love educators. I want to go on, on record, love educators, but I don't always love education um, because so much of education is, is often presented in this therapeutic kind of format. I'm not against therapy, but I, I think... Um, I think we're also, we, young people experience certain things and um, the social system also helps them almost just focus on that and not all the incredible positive things. All that said, the painful things are really, really painful. They're not made up. The person feels it as pain and they, they really need to be looked at in that way and accepted in that way and worked with in that way. Thank you. I see that we have... Hi. Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Katrina Berglund. I'm a student here at Bethany. And um, I was just wondering, um, looking at the bottom of page five and then the top of page 15, um, we're looking at the ways in which, you know, the world um, tries to convince people to deal with their struggles. You know, the um, tranquilizing the trivial, fill the emptiness, pleasure, greed, sex, all that stuff. But then looking at page 15, Luther's suggestion, I mean, Surely he's not suggesting that people who are already struggling with sin and temptation, you know, decrease their inhibitions through alcohol. I mean, how do we reconcile, you know, criticizing, obviously, the way that people often deal with things through, you know, um, alcohol or drugs or all these other things that's going on in the world with what Luther's giving as advice of drinking more? Yeah. Thank you. That's a, that's a really... That's a really spot on question. I, I really appreciate it. I, I think that phrase tranquilize with the trivial, which is a phrase which I really like. I think I'm taking that from Ernst Becker, his book, Denial of Death. I think if that would be the, the footnote in there. And um, so um, Becker is, is a kind of a, a post Freudian perspective on, on psychology. Um, I, I think the, the big difference the big difference that, that is brought out here is, is to tranquilize yourself with the trivial is, is in, in, in this secular worldview, there, there is no fallback to um, your ultimate good, to God. Everything is about your own development of yourself and your bereft of God as the, as the way by which you could evaluate your life and that you can find meaning and purpose in. So young people are, are urged to discover who they really are, but they're not urged to discover who they really are in light of the story that God gives us in the Holy Scriptures, which would be our compass or identity for, for a person to really find who they are. Um, so, you know, as St. Augustine put it, you know, the, the, the task is to know God and to know the soul but you only truly know yourself in light of God. So, so the, the whole thing there about tranquilizing yourself with the trivial, that is assuming a context of meaningless, of uh, uh, ultimately a meaninglessness. It, it, it's really very sad. This is not a very thoughtful way to deal with young people at all. I, I find it really insensitive. Um, Luther's context is always assuming the Christian faith. It's always assuming the truth of the scriptures. It's always assuming that your identity is coming from God. 
And the, the little reference there, uh, uh, references about you know living it up, drinking, isn't isn't re, isn't tranquilizing yourself with the trivial, trivial. It's relativizing what depression does to a person. Depression, in the long run, wants to immobilize a person. Uh, myself, I've had family members who um, have been agoraphobic. Okay, now I'm grateful to God that that eventually they got over their agoraphobia. I'm certain that was incredibly difficult for them to do. But that's exactly where, where anxiety and depression wants to lead a person, to make you incredibly powerless, to take away your agency, to have any fear to, get, uh, to, to magnify fear of getting out there in public. And, and what Luther is doing is he's making this all relative. He, he's finding strategies so it does not... It, it does not define you. Um, it, it, it's, it's very empowering. It's very imp I understand um, those of us here who are between 18 and um, 20, 21 years of age, I understand any talk about drinking is, raises concerns. I, I completely understand that. But I don't think that, again, Luther's point is to disempower the depression. It's brilliant, truthfully, because that's what depression always wants to do to a, a, a person is to disempower them. Luther's strategy is to disempower the depression. Uh, that's one of his strategies. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Paul Meitner from Zion uh, Lutheran in Winthrop, Minnesota. Uh, my question has to do with uh, uh, the bottom page 10. Um, I really enjoy the uh, your... You're contrasting the um, lexio oratio contemplatio with oratio meditatio tentatio. It's very interesting. Um, given if that is the if that's the basis of Lutheran Zales Orga, that's that's the principle we're with. I wonder if you can comment on how the reformers of that age uh, balance that principle. Not only personally, I think you did an excellent job talking about the personal one-on-one. -on -one. Um, kind of relationship with a pastor and a, and a penitent, but also how did that affect the creation of their church orders? Uh, um, you know what what they would, you know how how worship was carried out, and um, um, also how did that affect? Um, you know I, I think of the small catechism where this is really important for that Zales organ be going on not just by the pastor but also by mom and dad with the kids and uh, fellow Christian with each other. I wonder if you can comment on some of those aspects. Well, that's a brilliant question. And, and um, I, the, the, the right people to answer it are sitting up here. They're to my left um, because, because Professor Mays and Professor Pless simply know way more about the formulations of church orders. It's, it, it, I hate to just be totally honest with you, but this, this paper itself was definitely pushing me. So I... I wish I could say more things. These guys over here are the right people to ask with that. Yeah. That was a good deflection. <laughs> uh, my name is Michael Holman, and uh, I'm a, I'm a uh, liberal arts major, uh, graduate in 2003 from Bethany. And... Um, I, something struck me with your paper and then also the comments that have come afterwards, uh, bringing to mind the question of truth and also then of, um, of education. Uh, so I feel like there's kind of a crisis of education right now. Um, and I think all of our Lutheran church bodies are experiencing it where... Um, education is for the main purpose of making money. And like this swamps any exploration of truth, almost like what is truth? And what's important is that you get a good career. And uh, I mentioned uh, graduating in 2003 because that was a, when I was a student here, they really had an inter-faculty fight over um, expanding the majors uh, of this institution to attract more students. And one side was concerned that if we did this, 
our, um, it might change our identity, where we're not a liberal arts school, we're not searching after truth, instead we're just preparing people for a career with kind of a sidelight of Christianity. So what struck me as I was listening to your paper is that this can sound kind of specialist, like the stuff that you laid out about Anfechtungen and Luther's view of the soul and how life is and how we should come to an understanding of God and trust in him and all that sort of thing. It can sound specialist or it can sound outdated. Like today we got Xanax and um, what's important is that you get a job so you can buy it and uh, tranquilize yourself and all that sort of stuff. But it really requires a, um, a search for truth that we are all to be engaged in. And there's, uh, you know, I think you mentioned even with young people, I wonder if there's something good about uh, people at least being honest about their hurts or something like that. At least finally they're realizing that life isn't just about so-called progress yeah. or making money or, you know, so for so long, soul care has been thought of as like outdated because we should pursue other things uh, that will promise, you know, greater things. Oh. Yes, uh, Steve Bauer, uh, I serve uh, Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Gibbon. Uh, two questions for you, or one question, I'm gonna lead, lead to one question. On page 10 at the top, Third line, or leading to the third line, it says, what is a pastor's calling about both groups default to the modern role of pastor as therapist? So I'll kind of stop there. And then if you turn to page 14, starting in the middle, um, you give a very amazing, eloquent description of what we would call today cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so, for example, the bottom of that, uh, that um, the big first paragraph, you talk about moving to a larger rational framework. Uh, today, we'd call that generalization. In the fourth line, then, um, you talk about cognitive and diversional strategies to counter depressive moods. So, um, if I might expand on that in talking about uh, top-down versus bottom-up strategies for, for dealing with um, depression. Um, and then also not um, isolating yourself, but also being around others. Wow, I mean, as I've read um, CBT uh, counseling guides, that's well worth it, um, with all, all within that. So my question is, um, on page 10, you say, a default to the modern role of, of pastor as therapist, and then on page 14, you evidently make a whole lot, lot of use of, of therapy stuff. So my question is, you know, how can we um, draw and reconcile the two pages together? Yeah, I don't think, again, um it's, you know, and I, I made it very clear how much I love educators, but I don't like education, okay? So edu ed ed educa for educators, every year there's always a, a, a new uh, fad. But if you look at all these fads, they all go back to John Dewey. And there isn't any Dewey fad that wouldn't have gone back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And so the truth of the matter is, is as, as this... Uh, psychological language in the paper, uh, words out of therapy, therapy and whatnot. The, the truth of the matter is um, our ancestors already had this in place. So we use different words that they will claim to be scientific because they will find statistics behind it and statistics makes it scientific. But in truth, the, the sort of things that Jean Gerson was bringing up, um, there's strategies that would have been brought up by the Stoics in the ancient world. Um, it, 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 it simply folds over. And I think we can appropriate these psychological terms. Uh, but the roots of all this are out of the ancient world. Yeah. Uh, my name is Barrett Stephan. I'm a pastor of St. John Bingen in Decatur, Indiana. Um, towards the end of your paper, you talk about uh, accepting suffering as God's chastisement. 
Um, and I want to just hear your thoughts about how that squares with the practice of lament. Well, a lot of work that I've done um, over the years um, has been involved with Oswald Bayer and, and bringing some of his work in, into the English language. And I think, I think um, Bayer, that's one of his, his greatest strong points is it, it, for me to talk about um, um, God is hidden is, is in my opinion, you're, there is a very different thing encountering God's accusation. There's nothing hidden about it when Nathan goes to David and makes it clear you are the man. That is, that is God's judgment being put right out there. But when we encounter hiddenness, God forbid, like the death of a child or any number of things that, that can bring storms into a person's life. Um, yeah, why do these things exist had Adam and Eve not sinned? There, of course, we wouldn't have this, we would have an Edenic world, not the kind of world that, that we do have. Um, but I think that it's a very powerful thing that, uh, again, I, I, maybe I make things too personal about bringing up my own family members, but a family member, in many respects, the closest family member for me was a person I just wanted to say, your mother died when you were 10 years old. I've never seen you ever, your entire life shed a tear, not once. Are, are you following me? There's a real disconnect if you never shed a tear when you experience that kind of loss. In other words, had you had more skills and an, and an ability to lament, to shed tears, you might have been able to find whatever kind of psychological peace there is in such an overwhelming loss for, for a child. So um, um, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at here, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, I, I just think, read the Holy Scriptures, look at the book of Psalms, look at Jeremiah, so many passages, give words to lament. And, and lament is something that we shouldn't avoid. It's just part of our creaturely experience, our, sinful, our, our experience as sinners until our Lord returns. But, but our Lord has given us tear ducts. They, they not only clean our eyes, but they help us to get pain outside of our bodies. Thank you. Um, on top of page number five. Mike, you need to introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm Pastor Mike Muhlenhard from Cottonwood. But I thank you, pa uh, Professor Mattis, for your paper, Dr. Mattis. Thank you. Um, on top of page five, you talk about a freedom from religion. And I'm not disagreeing with that because I think that's widely accepted. But I began to think that we, the bigger problem is um, not, a, not a freedom from, not a desire for freedom from religion, but rather a pursuit of re the religion or worship of self. Mm -hmm. My own personal opinion trumps anybody else's. So how do we deal with that as we're trying to help people and share the word? And how do we... When they, when they just have no desire to hear any opinion but their own, how do we, do we just accomplish that by persistence and love, or is there some other help? Or, or is a, am I describing a, a difference without a distinction? No, oh, you're, you're really, uh, that's, uh, you're totally accurate. And it isn't, um, I think that freedom from, there's like a freedom from religion foundation I, I, I think what you've so helpfully said is um, when I when I talk about systemic secularism is that people are, in, if you need something to be demythologized, it's the myths that our current culture believes. That's what needs to be demythologized in light of the scriptures. And the scriptures provide the key to do that demythologization. Um, so it's not that people are somehow unreligious, they're all too religious. In fact, they're all too superstitious. They, they live all too much in a mythological realm. Um, and um, I, and I, I like how, you, how, again, what should my role be in leading someone to Christ? Um, I think it's, 
I, I read in between the lines, you put yourself out there, which I think is already part of the situation. Uh, many of the, the clergy that I know from my own background tend to be people, in my opinion, who are quite comfortable with church people, but they're uncomfortable with unchurched people. And so I think part of the task for a pastor is to teach himself how to become comfortable with the unchurched if he isn't already. Um, myself, I come from a family. My, my father's family is very devout. My, my mother's family is, is simply has no connection. They're not anti-church, but they don't have connections with church. My mother wasn't baptized till she was 11 years old or so. And so I think the ability to um, become comfortable, not that you agree, but they don't scare you. And so um, when they come to a point where the, the pieces don't f fall into place for them, you're there with a, world, a, a, a word that can make a difference in their lives. I think um, many, I understand, especially perhaps with, with um, the ELS and, and the Wisconsin Senate, I, I, don't, I don't wanna push any button by talking about apologetics. But I do think it is wise um, for a, a pastor, um, at least in apologetics as public relations, because so much of systemic secularism portrays what our faith is all about as oppression. And so you really need some way of addressing that. And, and they can do that because people don't know history. I, I once checked how much history is required in Iowa high schools, uh, a 0 0.5 unit of history. If you don't know history, you are set up to be lied to by the father of lies. So, um, so I, I just, I, I applaud you. I think that's to be out there. When, the, when pieces fall apart for people, then you're available to, to witness to, to the truth. Well, we are up on time anyway, so mm -hmm. Dr. Mattis will be back Friday afternoon and there will be opportunity to ask him further questions on his paper and maybe in light of the other papers as well, you'll, you'll have a uh, more complex question to ask him. A reminder for the Reformation Lectures Committee and the presenters, we're going to be taking a picture right after this, so don't disappear. We will resume at 2 p.m., but please take this opportunity to thank Dr. Mattis.